Hello and welcome to Stocks Down Under. My name is Stuart Roberts and I'm one of the co-founders of our publication. And joining me from Perth on the afternoon of uh, Wednesday, the 13th of July, 2022, is Dr. Alex Andrews, who's the relatively new CEO of Neurotech International ASX NTI. Alex, good afternoon. Hi, Stuart. So, um, Alex, uh, you've got probably the biggest um, clinic, piece of clinical data of any life sciences company on ASX this year. Uh, Neurotech International has been working for a while now on a, a particular kind of medicinal cannabis that you in license to the company, I think it was two years ago. You've mm -hmm. just got some great data in the autism spectrum disorders. To share with us what NTI 164 has been able to do for a bunch of kids with moderate to severe um, autism. So our product, NTI 164, is a unique strain of medicinal cannabis that naturally contains really high levels of CBDA and or it contains little to no THC. So that's an important combination and an important foundation to start with. We have used this drug, NTI-164, in a population of children with moderate to severe autism and shown that we were able to reduce their symptoms in 93% of that population. I'm guessing it's not possible to get uh, P, P, P less than 0.05. But uh, uh, when you uh, drill down to the, um, uh, the details of that data, what particularly impressed you amongst that 93%? It was the, the sh showing that they had such a reduction in the symptoms from baseline. So the professor, Michael Fay and his clinical research team really assessed these kids firstly uh, without any medication and established their personal baselines. This was then compared to their performance when they were taking after they've been taking the drug for some time. So showing that comparing your baseline to post baseline, we were actually able to get a statistically significant effect. I'm sure you had some champagne that night once the data came out, because uh, we're, we're talking um, uh, a, a peak was not, uh, less than 0.05 in a patient population that small. Um, everyone who knows this, uh, this particular condition ought to be sitting up and taking notice. Um, at the moment, if uh, families uh, have a child with, with autism, there's nothing much they can do with those kids other than um, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, I'm, I'm guessing. Yeah, that's it. Well, that's, that's definitely a, an important element of their care. Which their, is expensive uh, too, right? Of course it is, yeah. But necessary, I think it's, it's definitely an important part of the therapy process. The, in terms of the drugs that are available to them, there's very little options available Currently, the only FDA approved drug is called risperidone, and that's an antipsychotic with some pretty horrific side effects, right. including things like weight gain and all sorts of things. So right. it's not, not desirable, but that's all they've got. Survey the patients and uh, the, patient, the, the parents of these kids, and uh, no one wants to put their kid on risperidone unless it's absolutely necessary, right? Even the doctors don't like prescribing it. Right, right. Now, um, uh, those of us who know the medicinal cannabis space know the term CBD and THC. THC is obviously the stuff that gives stoners their high. CBD is the good stuff, uh, which has a range of, of, of potential benefits, including, for instance, uh, pain reduction and so forth. You talked about CBDA, which I understand is, is almost a trace element in, in, um, in, in uh, cannabis indica. Um, uh, talk to us about CBDA and why it's important in this condition. So CBDA is a minor cannabinoid. As you say, it's considered a trace element in most other um, plants out there. However, we've got the, this very unique strain of medicinal cannabis that naturally produces really high levels of CBDA. And we believe that's the secret ingredient to our, our recipe. Okay. And yeah, again, it's, it contains little to no THC, which is the... Right. The that you have. Now... Uh, Alex, you've got a, a big problem ahead. Um, you've got to go and talk to various regulators about how uh, they should regard your product in a condition, as you say, where there's not much drug therapy available. Um, and, uh, and obviously the regulators are still figuring out how, how properly to regulate uh, medicinal cannabis products. Talk to us about some of the challenges you, you think you'll face as we, we scale up to, I'm guessing, a phase two, three from here, given the, the phase two data was so good. Absolutely. We're, we, we're getting ready to start our phase two, three trial. And we've got a really clear roadmap when it comes to the US FDA. We've got some fantastic consultants in the US with their boots on the ground. We'll be going off to Washington later in the year to have a face-to-face -face meeting with the US FDA. 
and get their sign off on our roadmap. Right. Um, are they going to give you some challenges, for instance, in terms of, of, uh, of manufacturing? Um, uh, any cannabis product is going to be complicated. And, uh, and obviously, um, uh, guaranteeing batch to batch consistency is going to be an issue. Uh, so how are we going to uh, manage those challenges when we talk to uh, agencies like the FDA? So all of the manufacturing is done with licenses through the appropriate drug, Centers for Drug uh, Control. And in terms of batch to batch consistency, we've we do need to maintain uh, within a certain specification of these ingredients, but we've so far had no trouble doing that. So we've been showing very consistent batch to batch product consistency. Okay, so now talk to about the timeline of this phase two, three. Um, you, it, 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 I suspect it's not going to be too difficult to find uh, uh, treatment centres willing to participate in the study. What are your preliminary thinking about um, uh, size of the trial and, and, uh, and, and what sites would be involved? At this point, it's going to be doing, we're going to do it at the Monash Children's Hospital again with Professor Michael Fay. Okay. The actual exact number of participants is still yet to be finalised, but we do have an extensive growing list of over 150 families who have registered their interest already. So we'll have no trouble recruiting. And that's an important part because a lot of other clinical trials have a lot of difficulty when it comes to finding the right participants who are willing to dedicate their time and uh, energy into participating in a trial, but we have got such an overwhelming interest from the population. Right, um, and and the agency, uh, as in the FDA in this case, is comfortable with a with a, um, a a single site on the other side of the world. Ordinarily, they like to have more um, uh, sites in their own country, for example. Or, or I mean, not ordinarily. Every every case is different, but uh, I'm surprised that they're they're happy with just a single site um, uh, that's not in the United States. The FDA is really concerned with two things. That is safety and efficacy. If you've got the data that backs up these things, the FDA doesn't have a problem. All right, that's exciting. Now, um, really puzzling, the share price didn't uh, react to this one. Uh, what do you think the, the market is missing other than the fact that we're in a bit of a life sciences bear market at the moment? Look, Stuart, you understand the markets better than I do. <laughs> I don't know what the market's missing on this one. I think it's a really great opportunity. Right. Well, okay. Let me let me summarise it and and, and ju jump in if I if I miss something here, Alex. Um, investors out there, you need to pay attention to uh, to Neurotech International because they've just got some really compelling data in a, a disease condition that that potentially affects one in a uh, hundred of us. Uh, so one in how many? Zoom? One in forty four kids in the US. Okay, there you go. The, the, the numbers move around a, a fair bit. We're talking a, a billion dollar market opportunity with, with, with no drug therapy. In this case, with no side effects and 93% uh, of, of the ch children in this case uh, re re responded. Um, and, yet, uh, and yet you didn't want to buy this, this, this stock. Um, uh, maybe after this, uh, this interview, you might uh, go back and look at, uh, at what a ridiculous market cap Neurotech hit, ha is, is showing. Now, Alex, did I tell the story as you would tell it? Yes, Stuart, well done. <laughs> now, Alex, for investors who don't know you very well, um, some of you uh, who've, who've invested in um, uh, in another company, ASX NSB, uh, Neuroscientific Biopharmaceuticals, may have met you previously. Mm -hmm. um, before that, you were uh, you obtained your PhD at the University of Western Australia in um, in Professor Zimmer's laboratory. Uh, tell us about your career and how you and what's brought you to uh, Neurotech. Yeah, so I did my PhD at the School of Pediatrics and Child Health at UWA. I've always been very interested in, in kids' brain development. So Neurotech is right up my alley. And I then worked at linear clinical trials where I was involved with going off to the US a lot to try and encourage the US biopharma companies over there to do their clinical trials in Perth. In Perth, because it's obviously it's a lower cost op uh, opportunity than, than what a lot of these Americans are paying back home, right? Yeah, absolutely. Right. Take advantage of the R&D tax incentive and you can do it a lot faster in, the U in Australia compared to some of the timelines in the US. So there's definite advantages to, to doing your trials in your early phase, particularly in Australia. And I learned a lot through that role in terms of clinical trial design and understanding how these biotechs work. So that put me into good stead for working at NSB for the next few years where I was director of operations and then was approached by NTI recently and I've joined as CEO. 
Right. And um, uh, I mean, obviously, it's been a, a fast learning curve for you, but you've got some uh, some great help there. You've got uh, uh, Brian Liebman as, as your chairman. Many people who know the life sciences space will have met Brian in, in some of his, his previous very successful roles, in, in, including ResApp. Um, talk to us about um, uh, about some of the other strengths of the board that you're, you're working with at, at NTI. We've got uh, Professor Alan Cripps, who is a uh, professor emeritus uh, at, at Griffith University, an incredibly distinguished scientist and wealth of knowledge when it comes to all things medicinal cannabis. And I've got uh, Krista Bates, who's a partner, ex-partner at Lab and Legal. We've got Winton Willisey and Mark Davies, who have got extensive backgrounds around finance and business, corporate governance. So very well-rounded board. Oh, I nearly forgot uh, our most recent appointment of Gerald Quigley. And Gerald comes from a background of pharmacy. So he's got extensive arrangements around uh, how to progress these drugs through the US FDA, but also the TGA here, and also a background in media. He does lots of TV, TV appearances and radio. Okay. so. Um... In terms of the timeline of getting ready for phase two, three, when do you hope to be dosing your first patient? Obviously it's, it's early days, but what would be ideal? Ideally we'll start, start in Q3 this year. Okay, great. It's a, it's a busy timeline. I, I'm surprised you even have time to talk to uh, stocks down under. <laughs> Alexandra, uh, well done on what you and your colleagues have achieved. Uh, as it's very exciting. And, um, and here's to the next stage of the journey and particularly that uh, phase two, three, bringing it together. Thank you, Stuart.